Thank you very much, Mustafa, and good morning to everyone. Thank you for the first inspiring panel. Um, we're moving on to our second discussion this morning, but very much saying in the same spirit. We've just been talking about collaboration across the financial sector, the different components of that, insurance companies, banks, investors. Um, we actually finished on that note yesterday as well, when we were talking about collaboration and harmonization, common languages across sustainability initiatives and the different frameworks that exist. And so we're staying in that same spirit of collaboration, but focusing today specifically on disclosure on the one hand, and on the other hand to do that as regards uh, frameworks and very specifically in this case, the ISSB's standards and the EU's CSRD ESRSs. So that is basically what um, we're going to be focusing on today. Um, disclosure, of course, is a very, you know, remains, has always been a very important part of the sustainability uh, landscape. Uh, we've had many frameworks in the past, GRI, you know, we've had the, the CDPs, we've had the SASBs, we've had CSD, DSB. Um, and with the arrival of ISSB, there's been strong consolidation in terms of disclosure frameworks that speak to investor needs. Um, but in a European context, um, of course, what is on everybody's minds is how, what the interplay will be and how to manage across what is effectively, uh, you know, a, a jurisdictional framework and a regulatory framework um, such as the CSRD and an international, uh, you know, global baseline provided and proposed by IFRS with the Sustainability Standards Board. Um, so I'm very pleased today to be welcoming um, two very illustrious uh, representatives, um, one from each of, uh, of these uh, organizations. I'd like to welcome Gemma Sanchez Danis to the stage. Um, she is basically interim head of secretariat and directing um, reporting under EFRAG. I'd also like to welcome to the stage Ravi Abiwardana, who is director of strategy and also capacity building for IFRS, specifically with regards to the sustainability standards. So please, if you'll kindly join me on stage. We didn't actually discuss seating arrangements. We discussed a lot of things before this session, but not seating arrangements. Um, so thanks again for being with us today. Um, I think the audience was, was very keen to hear um, about uh, you know, your, your work and in particular how uh, indeed these, you know, these two frameworks will function together. And we've, you know, we, we have a good amount of, of time today to unpack that. But I think it's not unhelpful to start with you know, just go back to basics for a little while um, and remind ourselves basically, um, you know, the nature, the scope, the target audience, the objectives of each of these standards, um, because obviously they each have their own context. And the first step to understand, you know, how the interplay will work, where there can be scope for harmonization, for interoperability, um, does start actually with understanding a bit of the, the background to all that. So perhaps I can start with you, Ravi if you'd like to start us off with, you know, the sustainability standards, and then we can turn to Gemma and uh, the EFREG. Thank you. Of course, and thank you ever so much for inviting us here today. And thank you ever so much for those um, attending, both in person and virtually. So um, I guess from our perspective, this is a pivotal milestone uh, from a sustainability disclosure perspective. Um, we, um, a couple of months ago, released our inaugural Sustainability Disclosure Standards, IFRS S1 and S2. And um, it's important to reflect upon that uh, where we are at the moment and that sustainability disclosures or sustainability standards aren't necessarily a new thing. And there has been um, quite a lot of traction before uh, the establishment of the ISSB. Um, I think this would be a very important point to actually articulate um, what investors um, are, are, are asking for and, um, and how that led to the actual establishment of the ISSB uh, back at COP26 um, in 2021. Investors, um, um, or, what, or from what we've heard, are requesting um, high quality comparable and consistent information about sustainability-related risks and opportunities. 
However, when we looked at the actual landscape before and prior uh, to the establishment of the ISSB, um, investors um, and companies were ultimately struggling to actually um, do, 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 do just that. So there is neither um, consistent nor tailored information to investors from companies when it came to sustainability-related risks and opportunities. And uh, from a preparer perspective, there was confusion. There was a myriad of um, standards and frameworks um, out there for companies to actually um, go about and disclose sustainability-related risks and opportunities to their investors. And that confusion um, and those myriad of standards and frameworks often led to costs, costs to the company and, uh, and a lot of duplication as well. Um, the ISSB, we exist to actually address those concerns. Uh, and we've developed um, IFRS S1 and S2 to ultimately address that. And we've done that by consolidating um, uh, quite a few investor-focused frameworks and standards, um, those being um, SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, but also um, uh, the work of the TCFD to ensure that there is one standard that can be used globally by preparers to communicate to their investors in a clear, consistent and comparable manner so that investors can ultimately uh, be informed um, of what a company is up to um, with respect to those matters. And it's important to, to, uh, to, to reinforce that we're looking to reduce fragmentation and, um, and in doing that, and in and in publishing IFRS S1 and IFRS S2 at the back end of June this year, um, we have um, looked to address um, and create a global comprehensive baseline of sustainability-related financial information to investors. And this has been critically uh, um, supported by uh, the International Securities Board, uh, IOSCO, who recently endorsed um, our, um, our, our, uh, our standards. But also, it's been supported by the Financial Stabilities Board, um, which hosts uh, TCFD, but also the G7 and the G G20. So uh, let me just take a, a couple of minutes just to run through um, 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 our standards and, uh, and, and where we are. Um, the development of this comprehensive global baseline via IFRS S1 and S2 was done via a collaborative process. We've reached out to various different jurisdictions, including the European Union, um, uh, to create this, um, this baseline, and we were informed by the market. A lot of you um, here have actually responded to those initial consultations, and we fed uh, and we reflected upon that and developed these um, the final standards. Um, we already know that Australia, the UK, Japan, Singapore um, have already made significant steps to incorporating this in, uh, within their legal structure, including Nigeria as well. So from an IFRS S1 uh, perspective, that provides a preparer with uh, um, disclosure requirements. To, um, to disclose sustainability-related risks and opportunities. It covers the core content uh, as sent out by TCFD, and it also um, covers off um, the materiality approach as well. It's overarching and requires an entity to go about uh, their sustainability-related risks and opportunities in a connected manner with their financial statements and to disclose their information via the general purpose financial report alongside their financial statements because both of those pieces of information are for investors. And it also requires industry specific requirements as well, building upon the intellectual property which we consolidated back in 2021. And IFRS S2 is climate specific and a company who has identified climate as a sustainability-related risk or, or opportunity would use that standard to disclose um, uh, their, their, their information about 
climate-related risks and opportunities. It fully embeds the TCFD, and off the back of our announcement of the publication of IFRS S1 and S2, we will be taking ownership of the disclosure uh, analysis of TCFD f uh, over from the um, um, FSB. Uh, and it also sets out the requirements around physical and transition um, risks as well. So before I hand back, I just want to say a special thank you to UNEPFI for being uh, one of our capacity building day one partners. We know the importance of ensuring that these standards um, hit the market appropriately. And with your help, we, we, we very much look forward to um, capacity building uh, financial institutions here in Europe, but also further afield as well. Thanks, Ravi. So, investors, very clear. <laughs> and helping investors make their own decisions, the decisions they need to make. Gemma, over to you. Well, first of all, thank you for um, having us um, and thanks for hosting us here. Um, I would say that we are pursuing the same objective. Um, we come from a slightly different angle, um, which is the fact that we are the product of the European Commission's ambition. That's the Green Deal. Um, the Green Deal um, that is seeking um, the sustainable development in Europe and sustainable finance package, meeting the Paris Agreement. But not only these on the climate space, but also on the, on the social space about an economy that works for people and it's fair. So this is our mandate. So we are under the remit of the uh, level one text, which is the CSRD that was um, adopted last year. We are replacing a directive that most of you probably are complying at, uh, with at the moment, which is a non-financial reporting directive, the NFRD, that was asymmetrically applied across Europe in terms of a scope, in terms of assurance or audit requirements. So we are here to, to, to present, and, and, and we have already issued the ES addresses to the European Commission. That was November 22. The European Commission adopted um, the text of ESRS on the 31st of July, just before the, the holidays for South of Europe, uh, as a holiday present, and it's going through the scrutiny period at the moment. So um, the objective of the CSRD, and, and, and this is very much like what Ravi was saying, was actually seeking transparency. Transparency of what is the sustainability journey um, of each company and providing data. So data is key. Data is key for investors. Data is key for other stakeholders. We are on a double materiality regime, so um, our users are not only investors interested in financial information, but it's also, you know, um, it could be um, civil society, it could be affected communities, it could be employees. So it's, it's this impact dimension that for us is, is equally important, um, and, and that's what we are actually pursuing. So um, overall, if, if I... If I was to think about what is our ambition, is to be this platform and this platform of data, sustainability data, which is high quality data, which is a standardized data, which is audited, which is going to be in each company's annual financial statements, annual accounts. So this is what we are seeking. But we also know that in Europe, we are not the only initiative when it comes to sustainable finance. Um, for financial market participants, some, some of you, you have to comply with the SFDR. Um, you may also be on Article 8 taxonomy. Um, so we have to embed and be consistent with all these other regulations. So ESRS is the platform where SFDR data will be for companies, where Article 8 um, information will be disclosed. So th this is actually our overall objective. So let's be practical. So um, how is this standardization achieved? You know, how do we achieve this goal? So this goal is by creating a system, a reporting framework, which is not only climate first, because the ambition of the European Commission, and that's a mandate that we had was to actually cover the, the, full, the full spectrum. So it's environmental, five standards, social, four standards, and governance, one standard. So we are across the full spectrum. We are consistent with all the European um, legislation on, um, um, on sustainability, such as this SFDR, the pillar three for banks as well. We are seeing some of the pillar three data points that banks need in the ESRSs. Not all of them, because some of these data points or requirements would be sector specific, which is the next generation of standards that we'll be drafting, but we already see that. And then in terms of what's the scope, yeah, what's the scope of the companies that are actually applying the ESRS? So we're starting with large undertakings, including listed entities. Um, the, it's a staggered approach. So the first um, adopters will be um, in a scope for the December 2024 year end. So it's the 2025 reporting cycle. 
and then um, there's, there's a staggering um, of two years. Then at the moment we are discussing the um, listed SME standard. So this is a standard, a mandatory standard again. Um, um, and it will come the voluntary SME standard, the sector standard. So this is a process. So we are in a journey. Um, but um, it's important as well to recognize that the journey starts from the top. Yeah? And the top is the large undertakings. And it's a mandatory regime for European companies. And um, this is already coming. But we also understand that some companies um, may wish to actually be compliant with different frameworks outside Europe. So we, we take, for example, the ISSB. We have also taken inspiration from GRI. Some of the um, companies, large undertakings or listed undertakings have been GRI reporters for a number of years. So we haven't started drafting the standard from scratch. We, we are actually seeking this interoperability for us being interoperable and reducing duplication of reporting is super important. Um, and I'm sure that we will cover that in, in, in the next questions. We will indeed. Thanks, Gemma. So, as we can see, in the case of you know, the SRS, there's a number of different variables. Obviously, it's jurisdictional, so it's embedded in a broader policy perspective, positioning, vision, um, which is obviously very, very bespoke to that, uh, to that framework. It's tying in also other um, policy requirements and frameworks like the taxonomy, and indeed those, as a result, a multiplicity of audiences um, from you know, civil society to government and investors. Um, so there's definitely you know, a commonality in uh, the fact that we're looking at disclosure, that investors are you know, a core audience to this, um, but there are also some of those, you know, some of those differences. Um, what are the implications, I would say, in terms of, as a result, what may or may be, you know, different from one standard to the other? Um, as any disclosure standard, for instance, just to take an example, um, identifying which topics and which disclosure points um, to report on is obviously a starting point. Um, and that is one area where, of course, there are differences between the two standards. Um, you know, deter there's a... Uh, a process under the uh, the ISSB S1 to determine financial materiality. Uh, under the uh, ESRS standards, there's a requirement to break that down into the, you, you mentioned, Gemma, the impact materiality and the financial materiality and to consider both of those. That's one example, but perhaps you can delve into a little bit more of, you know, what are as a result, where do you see, um, you know, some of what, you know, might be the, the areas that, by definition, are a little bit different, and then those where it is possible actually to to really drive harmonisation. And of course, we'll go deeper into that later. And maybe this time, Gemma, um, we can start with you. Sure. So I, I would probably start saying that um, in the ESRS, so um, the ISSB um, has issued the the, the, the cross-cutting equivalent <laughs> for what, using our words and, and climate. So when we have been on lots of conversation, lots of hours at technical staff level to ensure that we fine-tune the standards, but not only on content and substance, but also on wording. Yeah? Um, and, and, and an example is financial materiality or the fact that we are on anticipated financial effects, which is not the same as potentially potential financial effects, and, and then there's a nuance there which is important. So, um, so we, we are happy that um, we have embedded all the data points um, that we didn't have for IFRS S1 and S2, um, that Europe could, could be said it's probably the first jurisdiction because we, we, we are in, in adopted and, and finalizing this process that has a high level of interoperability with the ISSB, so we are actually fostering this global baseline because de facto we have the ISSB data points in our standards, and that's fantastic. I think that's something that we're really proud of. Um, but as Karin was saying, we also acknowledge that we are in a double materiality regime. So financial materiality is very important um, for investors, but also we have this impact materiality spectrum. Now, there's conversions, yeah? There's conversions between the two. Um, is it a one-to-one -one relationship? I think it's difficult to say, because timing may be different, quantum may be different, but there's clearly a relationship. And, and, and when we're talking about the identification, which in our world is the materiality assessment, and we are now preparing some implementation guidance on that, we have working papers on our website, 23rd of August, SRB, if you're interested. We say that impact materiality is a good starting point, yeah? Because it could be so, it could be, and, and we know, and we have examples of impacts that will drive um, financial effects, that will be financial material. So for us, there's a clear commonality there. 
um, and we are working on, on that. Um, in our regime, and we, we are applying materiality. So what do you disclose? It's not like SFDR, the mandatory table where you have to report everything and it's a checklist, yeah? Um, you are subject to materiality. Is it impact materiality? Is it financial materiality? Or is it both? So this terminology which we keep using, impacts for impact materiality, risks and opportunities for financial materiality, is pivotal in, in, in all our standards. So apart from cross-cutting, ESRS2, everything else is subject to materiality. So even climate. Um, the European Commission um, did a final consultation on the ESRSs during the month of, Ju of June, and the consensus was that climate ESRS E1 is subject to materiality, but if it's not material for you as a company, you have to give an explanation. Yeah? And not only an explanation on the present, you know, why it's not material to, to you now, but also forward-looking. When do you think it could be material to you? So it's an exception to the rule, but everything is subject to materiality. The other important point, which was a consensus and compromise reached by the European Commission, which I think is very important for financial market participants, is that we have a number of data points that come from other European regulation, namely SFDR, Pillar 3, or the benchmarking regulation. These are subject to materiality assessment. Yeah. But it's also important that when the company has reached the conclusion that they are not material, then there's a clear you know, piece of information that says it's not material. So the bank collecting that data will know that the company, the underlying company where you know, they, they have investments or funding, has reached the conclusion that it's not material. So there's, there's this regime which is quite explicit in the case of climate. It's also very explicit in the case of um, these EU data points, whereby you are saying that it's, it's not material for you. Um, and I think that probably I, I'll, I'll leave it here for, for this one. Fine. Ravi, would you like to, to add from, uh, from your perspective, you know, where some of, the, you know, some of the convergence points are, where it really is possible to, to drive that harmonization and that interoperability that I think everybody's after? Um, and I'm just thinking on, you know, based on what uh, Gemma has said, where, you know, you, you talked about the, the double materiality perspective, but where you were suggesting, you know, at least a partial overlap of those, you know, of those analyses or the results of those analyses. And just to kind of flash back a little bit to one of yesterday's session where we were, you know, discussing kind of the, the voluntary initiatives and, you know, and their work to, to try and project clarity. Um, one of the things that has been done um, by the impact management platform, which brings these voluntary initiatives together, is to look a little bit at this question of, you know, impact, risk, materiality. And one of, you know, one of their findings has been to say that once you start to think about risk and opportunities at both, you know, a systemic level, as well as a more, you know, kind of entity by entity, idiosyncratic level, um, the boundaries or you know the dichotomy um, might be less further apart than we we think um, and so indeed there's that you know there's that common point but i don't know ravi if that resonates um and you know your your views on on that point of course other other areas you might wish to comment on also welcome yeah of course um uh, thanks ever so much and uh, a really interesting study as well by you know fine <coughs> sorry so First of all, I just want to mention that. <coughs> Thank you. So here you are. So um, European colleagues working together. This is an illustration. We didn't stage this. It's authentic. <laughs> um, so just building upon this um, camaraderie here, like. Um, um, with our European colleagues, we have been working so hard behind closed doors to actually make the standards interoperable. We heard that during our consultation. There are various, various different things which we heard during our consultation, but one of those things was interoperability. And it's really comforting to hear from a European perspective that they welcome the need for international um, consistency and this is what we've we're, we're here to do and we've been working with the European Commission and um, an FRAG to, to ensure that happens and address those comments um, which we received um, during the consultation it's important to note that the European Union 
um, was here before the ISSB. So when it comes to interoperability, it's a process of engineering um, rather than what we're doing with other jurisdictions where it's a component of building this into, <coughs> into their foundations. So this engineering process has taken a lot of time, not often visible uh, to the folks uh, here and online, but uh, a lot of uh, time and energy was spent going over the finer details from um, um, consistency in terminology and definitions, um, uh, especially around uh, components um, around IFRS S2. Um, and also the core content within IFRS S1, in particular around materiality. So um, where I, um, FRAG or the European uh, Union mentions uh, matters around financial materiality, it very much is a, <coughs> a lift and a shift um, from IFRS S1, making it easier for a preparer to actually interact with both standards. Um, it's important to know, and I think you've probably already garnered this, that there are um, areas where there are overlaps between um, IFRS S1 and S2 and the work of the European Commission. Um, but we do have different mandates, and I think we've already, we, we, we've already articulated that thus far. But while there are differences in those mandates, we have worked incredibly hard to actually ensure that where there are common requirements, that those are consistent. And this ensures that the investors, i.e. you guys, ultimately get the information which you need, which is high quality comparable information, especially for those companies who are um, disclosing against two reporting um, regimes. And this ultimately, this hard work which took place before the actual finalisation of the standard, standards um, will look to address one complexity um, with it, um, when it comes to actually, <coughs> sorry, when it comes to disclosing such information, but two, duplication. And, um, and this is a godsend for companies. I used to be a preparer, um, both from a financial reporting perspective, but also sustainability. And this will be a real hallelujah moment if I had received um, these standards uh, uh, a good few years ago. And it's important to note that in addition to interoperability, we are a global standard setter. So in addition to working with the, uh, our European colleagues, we're also trying to create um, a global comprehensive baseline across the globe. And we need to ensure that these standards hit the road, the rubber hits the road appropriately, and ensure that these standards uh, not only work in Europe, but also uh, further afield as well. And we've in included proportionality mechanisms within those standards to help everyone on this journey to disclose material information to investors when it comes to sustainability related risks and opportunities. And those proportionality mechanisms reflect a company's skills, resources, and capability to actually fulfill those requirements. I won't bore you with what those proportionality mechanisms look like, but we do have a lot of educational materials, a lot of supporting materials, which complement the standards that will take you, a preparer, um, on this journey to get started in disclosing information to your investors and build that really robust communication with your investors on common indicators that are, are, that are important um, uh, or that we've heard are important. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, Ravian. And sorry that <laughs> we've caught you <laughs> over the... Um, on that, on that sense, thanks for for giving that outline. And I think, as as you can tell, there's there's really a, a lot of effort that is going into making sure that you know where there is that common ground of you know the the audience and the objectives linked to that audience, things are as aligned and as interoperable as as possible. And I think that's that's good news for for everyone. Um, I'd like to turn it to the audience for questions and answers. But just before we do that, perhaps we can round off with a little bit of. You know, just giving people a sense of 
what more's to come, the things that are, you know, in the works at the moment to go even further, because obviously, you know, the standards are, are out and a lot of work has been terminological and you've had to think ahead, you know, that things will align properly. Um, but it's definitely not the end of the story in terms of actually implementing the, you know, interoperability of things. So perhaps we could round up on that and then we can have questions from, from the audience. And Ravi, we I was going to turn to you, but <laughs> if... Uh, yeah, the, if you the feel frog okay. has gone from my throat, so I can <laughs> so I, so I can take this. Um, I guess from from our perspective, um, I must reiterate the importance of working with our colleagues in Europe and um, uh, and the work thus far. Um, however, these are all been embedded within the standards and the standards themselves. But how can we take a preparer who needs to report against both jurisdictions on this journey. And we are working on a some form of a navigation tool so that an entity who is exposed to both of those things um, can ultimately figure out look, which requirement in ISSB ultimately meets a, a requirement from, an, uh, from a European Union perspective. And this navigation tool will also look to address incremental disclosures required by one set of standards but isn't required by another. And we're hoping you know, this piece of work um, together will provide uh, clarity for a preparer um, uh, to report against both, um, uh, bo bo both requirements. Um, and to facilitate this, we're also working on digital reporting as well. There's a live consultation out at the moment. So if there are any taxonomy experts in the room or listening um, online, I really do encourage you to actually take that opportunity and uh, react to that. Uh, there's only a few more days left of that consultation. It closes on the 26th of, um, of September. But the, the, the benefit of that in addition to what I've just mentioned around the navigation tool, is that investors often consume information from a uh, from a digital perspective, and perhaps this is an opportunity to further lament uh, what we're trying to do um, do together. Um, and I think um, just going forward, um, very much just encouraging this, you know, uh, this collaboration uh, between us and the the work that is required in you know, joint communications between both of our uh, bodies in trying to provide clarity uh, to preparers when it comes to interoperability between the ISSB and the European Union. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll pause there. Thanks. Excellent. So in terms of at present, currently, because <laughs> we have a lot of deliverables, but I'll, I'll focus on what we call set one, so on sector agnostic. So, um, as Ravi was saying, and I won't reiterate it much, but um, it's pivotal for us to work with the ISSB for this global baseline. At the end of the day, European companies want to be competitive around the world, and they have subsidiaries around the world. So, it's important for that, for us, and, and also for the European economy. So, um, in order to achieve that, we call it mapping table. You may call it navigation tool. It's pursuing the same objective. Um, there's a, a working paper um, mapping table that maps ESRS to um, ISSB, which is easier because we have embedded all the data points from the IFRS S1 and S2. Um, and also because in the case of the IFRS, um, there's some options because it, it works with more than one jurisdiction, which is in Europe. So in some cases, there's more flexibility of different options in the ISSB and in Europe because of the directives that we have under public policy. We only have one option in the case of climate in, 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 in some minor points. So this mapping table is a must for us. Um, it's a must not only for the human readable version, but also for digitization. So XBRL taxonomy, and we have some XBRL softwares in the room, um, is, is something where we're also working. We have staff-to-staff -staff, um, meetings because we want this interoperability to be at both levels. And this mapping table is the only way forward. So um, we understand that the ISSB will work on this mapping table on the other way around. So um, ISSB to ESRS, it's slightly trickier, um, but I'm pretty sure that it's going to be useful as well for, for all the preparers that, that require. So, so mapping table is first. Um, obviously, this cooperation won't stop with the ISSB, now with sector agnostic. Um, Sector-specific standards, SASB, this is another area where we will continue and pursuing the dialogue. Um, and the other areas where we are really busy at the moment um, are implementation guidance. It was a very clear message from Commissioner McGuinness, from FISMA, 
um, a couple of months ago, I think it was 6th of July, if I'm, my memory is not mistaken, about, okay, you know, the ESRSs are out, but how do you have to implement them? You know, let's give practical implementation guidance to companies. So we are doing that twofold. Um, on the one hand, we are currently working and, and, and our conversations are public and the papers are public in our website, um, pursuing European public good. Um, materiality assessment guidance, yeah? So um, we have some illustrations about how you could go on a materiality assessment guidance. Also value chain, the value chain concept, what it means, how far should I go? Unfortunately, we are not covering, for those in the room, financial services, which is a separate value chain conversation. We will cover that um, when we start the, the sector standards and we have a call for members to join our financial services working groups that is finalizing this week, 15th of September. So those of you that would like to join, you should definitely join us. So implementation guidance on the one hand, public feedback expected in Q4, maybe November, four weeks, and then um, we will publish it. But it's a non-authoritative guidance, so it's not part of a delegated act, and that should be um, borne in mind. And then secondly, we are going to issue or implement an ESRS access point whereby companies can actually ask questions to EFRAG, clarification type of questions on ESRSs. We are not going to cover CSRD questions, that's for the European Commission, but this is going to be another entry point when there's questions on how to implement said one, which is just round the corner. So that's where we're focusing our efforts. Thank you so much, Gemma, Ravi, for those clarifications. So as you can see, a number of resources um, coming soon to further help navigate um, the, the two frameworks. We've got a few minutes for Q&A, and I can see a number of hands up. So I see one, two, three, four. We haven't got an awful lot of time, but what we can do is take all the questions and then group them, right? So we have time. We can, we're told we can take just a couple of minutes from the coffee break. So one there. Uh, good morning again. Buchak and I from the European Banking Federation. My question is mostly for Hema. Um, and as you know, um, the EBF and SME United were uh, closely involved in the work of EFRAC uh, in developing um, a draft uh, set of um, standards for um, uh, SMEs, really small SMEs, unlisted, who actually are not at all required to do the reporting, but who might voluntarily may want to do, uh, especially uh, in anticipation of being asked. Uh, by either their financiers or by the larger companies uh, in the, the value chains of which they find themselves. Uh, so with that in mind, I want to ask you what your views are uh, for taking that work forward. Um, do you expect um, uh, these uh, voluntary standards in the future, in the, hopefully in the near future, to be really close to the standards for the listed SMEs or large companies, or do you expect them to be more suitable for the micro companies? Also in view of the cost benefit analysis for the ESRS, as you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of euros are expected uh, to be uh, spent for complying. So uh, Ravi, for instance, used the word preparer a lot in his uh, presentation, it's true. If you're doing it uh, for a preparer, it's one thing. If you're doing it for a company, that will want to do it on its own, um, then it's a completely different story. Thank you. Thanks. Should we perhaps take one other question, then we can respond, and then we'll take the other two, just to make good use of time. Thank you. Sonia Zorrilla from BBVA Bank. You talked about anticipated financial effects and potential financial effects. Are they the same? Please, could you elaborate a bit on that? Thank you very much. Perhaps we'll start with these two and then take the next round of questions since we have a bit more time. So I think the first question was, uh, was directed at, uh, at you, Gemma, and uh, I think perhaps both of you, if one of you want to come on, the second question on the differentiation of the terminology. Sure. Um, it's a very timely question. <laughs> we are now covering this topic at the tech and we have a tech member here and at the board level. Um, so as you said, it's voluntary. Yeah, so, um, and it's very clear for us, and we had conversations with your organization and also SMU United about what is the purpose, you know, of um, unlisted SMEs, which, you know, and there's an SME package released by the European Commission this morning on that, yeah, changing the bar. Um, so we, we are very conscious that the, the users, the banks, that will be funding them and financing them, may need certain information that may not be the whole spectrum. Um, and, and that's why when we are thinking about the SME and we are discussing that, we, 
we have a modular approach. Yeah, so we don't take the listed SMEs and have a baby version, you know, if, if, if I want to use um, simple wording, but we have a modular approach where there's ba where, whereby there's a module, which is the, the minimum, yeah, which is a subset of the listed, whereby we're having a conversation about materiality discussion on that. Should that be subject to materiality or it's easier for companies, especially unlisted entities, not to have materiality because materiality could be onerous, yeah, to do a materiality assessment. And then there's other modules that includes EU data points and all of that. So we are doing that on a modular approach, which we think actually would work better. But we are still, you know, it's it's initial stages, yeah. We we are discussing now, we had lots of conversations with you. We have community workshops with more than a hundred members every six weeks. So we are really working on stakeholder engagement on that front because we know how important it is and, and proportionality and what does proportionality mean versus what banks need. So we have a, a very innovative, if I may call it like that, model approach for VSME that we don't have for listed SMEs. And also we are not pursuing digitization of the voluntary SME. Yeah, we, we, this is something that we have put on a standby and, and that's what we are thinking at the moment. In terms of cost-benefit analysis, it's an interesting point, and we had a debate amongst ourselves, because how can you do cost-benefit on something which is voluntary? You know, what is your population? What's your starting point? So what we are looking at is now is, and, um, is looking at how we could actually look at the cost by not doing, you know, using a methodology that would make sense for a voluntary standard, because otherwise we have a problem you know, with one of the two um, factors when you do a cost-benefit analysis, but this is also something that we're looking at at the moment. But it's going to be different to list SME or the large undertakings, whereby our population was quite clear. Thanks. Ravi, do you care to comment on uh, anticipated and potential, the terminology question that was posed? Yeah, of course. I think this might have to be split between both because... Um, so from a, um, an IFRS sustainability disclosure standards perspective, we require an entity to disclose both current and anticipated financial effects. So let me just give you an example. So a company has made a decision to actually make a strate made a strategic decision to address climate change. Um, we require an entity to articulate and explain by their disclosures what would be the anticipated financial effects of such a decision um, and this could be disclosed either via a single quant single or a range uh, both from a qualitative and a quantitative perspective when it comes to anticipated financial effects the, we have a proportionality and mechanism around this bearing in mind that this can be challenging for for for, for many so that proportionality mechanism looks to address the skills, capabilities and resources for an entity to actually go off and uh, disclose such information. And if they are new to such requirements, um, there will be uh, a requirement for them to disclose qualitative information when it came to that, uh, when it comes to that, um, that, that particular requirement. Um, perhaps I'll uh, hand over to my European colleague to explain the potential component. Sure. So the buy is higher. Anticipated, the, the, the universe of anticipated is a smaller than the universe of potential in terms of probability. So we, because of um, us trying to seek alignment and the fact that this is a pure financial materiality type of data point, we are looking for conversions and, and we are actually moving to a lower bar because um, at the end of the day, you know, we, we cannot have two different bars for potential financial effects. In climate, I think the literature on financial effects is more mature than other environmental standards. We have financial effects in each of the environmental standards, qualitative and quantitative, as Ravi was saying. And there's a deferral for all companies, regardless of the number of employees, um, for disclosing quantitative financial effects in the first year. And maybe using qualitative financial effects, qualitative, in the first three years. Yeah, so... This is a higher bar, but we think that by having that bar, we are more aligned. And it wouldn't make sense that you are reporting different financial effects, depending on whether you want to apply ISB or whether you are in Europe and you are applying ESRSs. Thank you. And for, I have a little bit of bad news, which is that we can only take one more question in this room. But there's a good side, which is we're going to a coffee break next. So please, the other questions, keep them so that we can cover them over the over some coffee, but can I have one more question? Thank you. 
Hi, good morning. Uh, Michal Piechowski, Chairman of the BRAG. We have a pleasure to support both of your organizations in the digitization. Um, some years ago, we had a challenge, similar challenge in harmonizing standards across the banking sector for the CRD4 and an insurance sector for Solvency 2. We had different implementations in each member state. And back then, uh, EBA and IOPA have decided to actually um, dismantle, so to say, the definitions, create those very, very atomic models uh, instead of defining the uh, disclosure requirements just as we define right now for both ISSB and for ESRSs. We actually broke them down into like Lego blocks. Do you think that we could replicate this experience uh, to create more harmonization across the ESRSs and ISSB? Um, hi, Michal. <laughs> um, so, um, what we have in digitization and is that at the moment we're having a staff to staff discussions. Um, we are moving for a stage one of commonalities approach, which I would say it's concordance tables. Yeah. Um, so um, the, the option at the moment that we're exploring and working really hard on is this mapping table that we, we've mentioned. Um, and this will be the basis. And then in terms of how you, know, you go on the concordance table, the level of digitization, is it three tags from ESRS, is one to ISSB? We need to see. And this is something that I would say that it's very interesting, the debate that we have in, in, in this one. And, and obviously, we'll be interested in the results of your um, consultation. We had presented our results to the ISSB, and we're going to attend a meeting with you in London in October. But I think that you know, we have to think about, and we were discussing that earlier, the sustainability as a journey. Yeah? Um, and, and digitization is absolutely a front runner, but maybe we are not going to get there um, with this commonality of blogs or common dictionary even. Yeah? Um, so at the moment, we are exploring this um, concordance table, um, and hopefully as well with, you know, GRI would be something similar. Would you like to add to that, Ravi? <laughs> I think you dealt with that very well, so okay. there we are. In that case, um, my job now is to thank both of, uh, of the speakers for being with us today and taking the time to go through these concepts and to you know, tell everybody about you know, how you're working together to, to drive that interoperability and that practical <laughs> guidance that's, that's about to come. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.